How many of you has ever experienced a situation in your life wherein you really can't help it but ask, why me, God? Anyone? Why me? I bet you it's all of us, or at the very least, most of us. You know, lately, I met a man whose life truly blessed me immensely. And of course, I'm talking about Brother Winston. If you haven't heard or seen his uh, testimony, I would encourage you to do so. I first met him when Brother Jojo texted me and asked me if I can meet with Brother Winston and to chat and encourage each other. Because you see, Brother Winston has ALS. I can't pronounce the actual word, so let's stick with ALS. And since I have Parkinson's disease, it's kind of similar to each other. And I thought to myself, yeah, it would be good for me to meet up with Brother Winston and kind of encourage each other. Both our conditions are progressive, meaning to say it gets worse over time. But the biggest difference is ALS is fatal. Parkinson's is not. Except, of course, if I can't swallow something, <laughs> then I choke to death. Sorry for being so graphic. But when I thought of it, I said, yeah, I can. I, I will meet with him. And I thought, because, oh wait, I forgot, just in case you don't know him. He's the one in the middle. Don't mind the people uh, uh, in both his left and right. They're just bodyguards. Uh, the important thing is the man in the middle. So I thought, I am going to meet a man, because usually when I, have, when I meet other people with Parkinson's, uh, they blame God, they cry, they were disappointed at God. So I was thinking, with Brother Winston, it's going to be the same. But then I was caught by surprise. When I finally met him, I asked him, Brother Winston, when you realized, when you found out that you had ALS, did you question God and ask him, why me? I wasn't ready for the answer. He just smiled and looked at me and said, yeah, I asked a question, but it's not a question of God, why me? I asked the question of what now? Lord, what do you want me to do next? I was there to encourage him, but then he was the one who encouraged me. Brother Winston, you don't realize it, but you are really a blessing to me. I will never forget, and I will cherish that night that we met. How can a person facing death have that much faith? Right? How can a man whose motor skills are deteriorating as each day goes by and still smile and trust God? Only a man who has a strong relationship with God that can do that. Someone who believes that God loves him and this momentary suffering will eventually end with Jesus hugging him with his unconditional love. So how can we have the same faith as our brother Winston have? How can we walk in a manner that we always smile at God and trust him with everything? That is our topic for today. Because by experiencing God's promises through wisdom, we know how to walk, how to behave, how to make our decisions along the path of our life which Christ prepared for us. Remember two weeks ago I was mentioning the path that as we go through our lives, we imagine that we're walking on a path. And I gave you an example, right, about architect, that while I was walking along the path of my life, I wanted to be an architect. So my focus is architecture, and everything that I do, or most of the things that I do, is geared towards being an architect. Same as when I decided to be a pastor, the very person that I hate to become, I also focus on what does it take to become a pastor. So before we begin with the passage, I would like to remind everyone about the, what I told you guys two weeks ago, is as you walk along the path of your life, you pray to God and ask Him, what do you want me to be? What do you want me to do now? And focus on that, and all the while when you're walking along the path, you focus on the things that you have to do, 
to reach God's calling for you. And that takes wisdom. Unfortunately, a lot of us here don't want God's wisdom because we see ourselves as capable to live our own lives the way we want it to be. We, we studied in Ateneo, we studied in Sal, we have master's degree, we have doctorate degree. I can handle life on my own. But my proposal to you is don't stop at being smart. Don't stop holding your diploma. Don't stop holding your bank account to show people how much successful you are in business. But be wise. Be wise. How do, how, because usually, when we do, reject God's wisdom, we see him as something else. When it comes to God, we see him as not a source of wisdom and not as the guiding light for how we are to walk. We see him as the source of our salvation, and that's it. We see Jesus Christ, who's, we see Jesus Christ's mission as merely coming to down as a human being, taking our sins to the cross, and that's it. That's only what Jesus is supposed to do, and that's where we focus ourselves. But truly, honestly, look into your hearts. You know this is not true. Even in kindergarten, they tell you about the what? The death of Christ, the resurrection, and what, you, what God is calling you to be. We have a purpose. We are not just to proclaim or accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and then say, mission accomplished, I did what I have to do. Now I'm going to sit, just watch a TV, and wait until Jesus comes. If that was the case, you guys wouldn't be here, correct? If Jesus' purpose for all of us is to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and then that's it, we should have been raptured into heaven the moment we say amen to the sinner's prayer. If that's the case, then all of us can just go home now and wait for Jesus to come. We have a purpose. The moment that the Holy Spirit comes into your life, you have a purpose. And that purpose is one, one of the things that you should focus on while you walk along the path. Now, how do we do that? Let's look at this. Proverbs 2, 1 to 5. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Now take note of this. Those are the verbs. Accept, store up, turning your ear or listening, applying, calling out, and crying aloud, look for, search for. A lot of verbs, huh? That is not a passage for somebody who is passive and sitting around and doing nothing. That is a passage for a doer, an active person who goes out and searches for wisdom. For example, a farmer, a farmer who does not do anything, can he have a harvest? None, right? It is also strange for us or un it's not normal for us to just sit around and wait for wisdom to come and knock at our door. Wisdom should be pursued. Like a farmer, when he wants to have a harvest, he does not just sleep at night and say, the next morning, I'm going to harvest something. A farmer first what? Plants a seed, water it, fertilize it, take the weeds out, and then there is a harvest. How strong is your desire to have a harvest? Right there. If you look for it as for silver, and search for it as hidden treasure. That's what Jesus and God's wisdom is. And let's take a look at the first few. Accept and store up. What does it mean to accept? What does it mean to accept? If I have a gift here, and I didn't tell you what's inside, and I say, I'm going to give this gift to the first one who comes up here and grabs it out of my hands. What would make you 
run here and get the gift. Trust. You trust me, I hope. You trust that there's something good inside that package. You don't think that it's going to be the trash that accumulated last night, dinner, right? Because you trust me. Do you trust God? Do you only trust God with your salvation and not for your daily wisdom of how to live your life? Accept there is you look at Scripture, you look at one of God's commands, and then you try it. You try it out. Even if it sounds so unreasonable, you try out what God commands you to do, and then you experience the blessing of following Him. That's when you accept. Because you tried it, you know what, what will come to you if you tried it, and now you know that it's true, you put it in your heart, and there it stays. Because if what you read in the Bible, you just keep it here, and you don't accept it or store it up in your heart, the world's lies can get into your mind and change your mind. Because it's still here. Right? Hindi nyo na try out. Hindi nyo sinubukan. I got 75 in Tagalog, so bear with me. At least pasado. Keep it here. People will influence you. The evil world will influence you to turn your mind. But if you tried it out, you can say, that's not true because that was not what I experienced. And then you store it in your heart. What do you listen for? You need understanding to listen. The listen there is you listen carefully. For other people's testimony, or when you are in a M group, and a brother shares or a sister shares the same promise that you chose to apply, and how it was good to her, and then it will kind of trigger in you and said, well, if she tried it out and it was good, I should try it out too. Or you listen to the prodding of the Holy Spirit to tell you, now is the time to use what you learned, bring it down from your head to your heart, and apply it. So accept that all the promises of God is true, store it up in your heart, listen for the right time to apply and right time to do it, and then apply. Apply it out. If you don't understand it yet, you call and cry aloud for, Lord, for the Lord to give you understanding. And then you look for it as silver and hidden treasure. That is what it means to, you know, believe in God and apply His wisdom. What is stopping us from applying, honestly? Because we don't try it out. We don't try it out. We think that we know better than God. We pray for Him to forgive us our sins. We pray for Him to protect us. We pray for Him for our salvation. But day-to-day -day chore, day-to-day -day things that we do, tayo na bahala. That is not the case here. Our argument is, I don't see God. I can relate to you. It's hard to trust somebody that you don't see. It's hard to trust somebody that you don't hear. It's hard to trust in somebody wherein after you say amen, somebody's going to pat you in the shoulder and say, I got you. Just trust in me. When the Bible says we have to trust God, we have to look beyond what we see to what God sees. And we can't just you know, say that we know better. You remember the, uh, the story of Elisha and King Aram. King Aram hates Elisha very, very much. You know why? Because God will tell the prophet Elisha, tell the Israelites that King Aram is going to do this, going to do that. So every time the king sets up an ambush, the Israelites don't get trapped or ambushed because Elisha will warn them because of what God told them. 
So King Aram uh, decided, I'm going to kill that prophet. So one day, the servant of Elisha woke up and looked out the window, and they were surrounded by King Aram's army. Those are those round things there. Those are their tents. And then, of course, the servant panicked and said, and woke up Elisha, My Lord, my Lord, my Lord, we are surrounded. What are we going to do? And what did Elisha say? Wait, where did Elisha say? Don't be afraid, Elisha said. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Of course, the servant didn't see anything. Probably he was thinking, what is my master talking about? Probably he has to wash his face first because his eyesight was covered with muta. To, or glasses, he need glasses. But then Elisha prayed to God and said, well, what? Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And then the Lord opened his eyes, and that's what the servant saw. Chariots of fire, warriors of God, protecting Elisha. Because Elisha is a prophet, and he's supposed to be doing what God calls him to do. Do you believe that is also applicable in your life? Surrounded by heavenly beings protecting you? No? You don't believe that because you don't see it? You might say now, you're thinking right now, that's not going to happen to me. That's not the protection that God is giving me now. I don't see God caring for me enough because I'm not a prophet. I don't live in the Old Testament wherein God is more evident in speaking to people, doing things like that, and reprimanding people. That was in the Old Testament. And God only loves prophets because they are his spokesperson. Let me ask you a question. Is Winston a prophet? Brother Winston, is he a prophet? Are you a prophet? Does he live in the Old Testament? No one dares answer that. <laughs> then why, if he's not a prophet and he didn't live in the Old Testament, then why is he smiling and glorifying God with his life? Now, a disclaimer. Some of you might be thinking, why do I keep on mentioning Brother Winston? I'm not saying that he should be put in a pedestal for us to admire, to idolize. He's a human being. I'm a human being. All of you are human beings. And we don't know what the future will bring. Probably something worse is going to come and make him question. Or probably, you know, something will happen that he falls. What I want you to see is, at the present, how he handles his situation is a lesson for us to follow. What you need to see in Brother Winston's life is he is kneeling down before a pedestal, but it is not him that is up in the pedestal, but Jesus Christ. And in front of that pedestal is we see Winston kneeling down and trusting God. You might not be sure of what God is doing in your life today. You might not be sure of what is God doing in your life tomorrow. The main thing is you trust him enough to accept that God's plan, whatever he's doing in your life, whether it's painful or not, whether it's troublesome or not, it's for your best. No one can make a plan better than what God prepared for you. So what our work or what we need to do is to pursue and look for wisdom so that we know how to live just as Christ wants us to live. So what you need to do is search for wisdom like people search for treasure, accept it as the truth, store it in your heart, listen for the right moment to apply, and then apply it. And it's going to, you know, take away your anxieties, grant you peace, so that you can focus on what God wants you to do. Now, let me ask you this. How vigilant or how passionate are you in searching for God's wisdom? 
the Bible passage there uh, shows that it is comparing people or worldly people in pursuit of what? Silver and hidden treasure. If you have a map that shows you a chest full of gold and silver, precious stones, would you go for it? Would you look for it? You will, right? I mean, nothing wrong with having a chest of silver, but then how are you going to search or how passionate are you in searching for wisdom? It should be the same. So if we take it into a modern context, what are you passionate right now? When you open your eyes, para akong sirang plaka, you always hear me say this. What do you reach for when you open your eyes? Really? How can you look for God's promises and God's wisdom when you don't read about it? You can't say, I'm going to wait until Sunday and listen to the preacher. It is your responsibility to look into the Bible and search for those gold nuggets, those precious stones, for you to realize what you need to learn. And if you look in your calendar, what is taking up most of your time? That's your passion. That's your passion. I don't know if you are this kind of person. Like for me, when I'm passionate about something, I go all out. And that might be good, that might be bad. But if I were to think for myself, my, when my passion involves worldly things, it's going to get me in trouble again. So, buti na lang, I'm busy with the discipleship. That's why, that's why I pursue those things. Before when I was passionate, well, not before, when I'm passionate about cars, beside my uh, office desk, it's a huge pile of books, not magazines, books of a particular car. And guess what? It's all in Japanese. And I can't read a single character in Japanese. I can look at the pictures. But that's passion. You go to the Bible even if it's in Japanese, meaning to say you still don't understand. There are a lot of, I, it's, there's a lot of things in the Bible that takes a lot of time to research, study, because sometimes it, you know, brings us more questions than answers. So what we need to do is to search for it, to really dig deep in it, to, and to ask God, what is it that you want me to do? Because God is supposed to be your guide as you walk along the path that is your life. In the 1800s, there was this whaling ship who got in trouble in the Antarctic Sea. Well, story says that since it's a whaling ship, they go near a whale, but this time the whale, you know, attacked them. The boat started to sink. So the crew, with enough time, got into their lifeboats and then put a lot of supplies into their boats and started to row away. When they reached 100 yards away from the sinking ship, suddenly two crewmen jumped into the water and swam 100 yards on icy water to get into the sinking ship. When they came out, they were holding something. But then the person holding it suddenly lost uh, grip and it fell into the water. But both of them were fast enough to try to get it. Fortunately, they got it. Can you guess what is it that they risked their life for when they were already safely away from the sinking ship? Can you give a guess? The compass. Without it, they don't know which way they're going to row. God's wisdom is the compass. You are confused of what God is doing in your life. It's in the Bible. You don't know what to do next. It's in the Bible. We need to see God's word as the source of wisdom. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. 
He holds success in store for the upright. He is the shield to those whose walk is blameless. He guards the course of the judge just and protects the way of the faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you, and understanding will guard you. That last one is really important, the understanding one. Because if you don't understand, you won't apply. What is being said there is that when you search for treasure in an earthly way, you get silver, gold, precious stones. But when you search for God's wisdom diligently and passionately, what you get are three things. Victory, protection, understanding. What is being said, uh, I'll finish na lang with the, uh, this one. 12 to 22 naman is talking about the evil man and adulterous woman. And I won't read it now because it's going to, you know, extend the time. So what is being said here is the things that you will get might not be in the world standard as riches. It might not be silver in the eyes of other people. It might not be treasure in the eyes of many other people. But then that is treasure for you. First, victory. What you need to know is when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become victorious. Because when you look into the Bible or you go to God and ask for wisdom against sin, the picture of Jesus Christ will come out and the sacrifice that he did. So victory over sin, over death, and what's the other one? Judgment. So Jesus paid for your sins. If you accept him as your Lord and Savior, you are protected from the evil one. And then you have protection from judgment. Then the protection also protects you today and in the future. And then understanding. What do you need to understand? You need to understand what God is doing in your life. How, how so is that? As you are walking along the path, if you do not have a Bible verse that you have proven correct, you will go through life not having anything in your heart, no Bible verse in your heart. And when something comes around that surprises you, you don't know what to do. When temptation and trials come along, you will easily give in because you wala kayong pangon try. When Jesus was in the wilderness, 40 days of thirst, or he was being there, fasting, and then Satan came around and tempted him, how did he respond? He quoted scripture. How many of you here, when if tomorrow the stock market crashes or real estate prices go down, how are you guys going to respond? Or if the virus reaches Philippines and one of your loved ones is infected, who do you turn to? If you don't have a Bible verse, wisdom from God, Bible verse, and you keep it here, you don't put it here, and then something comes around as you're walking along, and then there's a lubak, a pothole, and then you experience that pothole, you experience a stumbling block, and then you just sit down. Sit down in your path, and then you say, Lord, I don't like what you're doing in my life. I'm staying here. I'm not going to move forward until you take away this stone in front of me. Now, if you take away this stone in front of me, then I will stand up and continue to walk. A lot of us are like that. We just sit down here, and then, Wah! if you don't take it away, I'm not going to move forward anymore. How many of you here has been to a toy shop and you saw a kid throwing tantrum because the mom doesn't want to buy him a toy? I'm not going to act it out because I was kind of like a spoiled brat also. Some of us, we don't wait. Some of us, while we're walking and then we experience trouble, 
We don't stop because probably we're thinking nakakahiya. So we grudgingly walk, walk, walk. And then a friend of ours or an acquaintance or a stranger comes in the opposite direction. Now we know if we're walking towards God and somebody's walking in the opposite direction, what's, what's going on there? It's somebody who's going to make you fall. That's the wicked person there and the adulterous woman. So you're walking, nakasimangot ka because you don't like what God is doing in your life. And then suddenly this person say, hey bro, remember the sermon two weeks ago? I don't think anyone remembers the sermon two weeks ago. So if this guy invites you to trouble and then you're making tampo with God, what would you do? More easily, you're going to turn and walk with him because you don't have any wisdom of God that you have proven to be true in your heart. No pangontra. Now, I'm not saying this is easy. This is hard. This is really hard, especially if the temptation or the trial is no one knows about it. You're alone, right? No one will know. No one's going to get hurt. To make this searching for gold, to make this obedience easier is to invite somebody to walk alongside you, side by side, so that when you fall down, he can pick you up. If, you fall, if he falls down, you pick him up. What you need is somebody to coach you, somebody to guide you, and you can guide him also. Now, sometimes the path will deviate a little because relationship, and then it will sometimes come back close together. It's variable because discipleship is organic. And of course, now that you are a Christian, you have choices to make. Because if, when you were not yet a Christian, you don't need to make any choice. Your road is straight and wide so that you can iwas the lubak in your life. But then it doesn't make you grow. So when you are an unbeliever and the road is straight, you don't need to be tempted. Whatever the, whatever the evil one, Satan, says to you to do, no second thoughts. You'll do it. But when you became a Christian, then every decision becomes a fork in the road. Should I follow Satan? Should I follow Jesus? And if somebody's walking inside along you, he's going to grab you by the collar and say, hey, 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 you're going the wrong way. Come here near me. We are going this way. That's what we need in this life. Somebody to walk alongside with. The, chan- the, the, the reason is, culturally, what's making us hesitant of be- having somebody alongside like that is we have to open up. We have to share our deep, darkest secrets so that the walk will be more effective. And being Chinese, we are not taught to be very vocal. We are taught to just in- keep on increasing the closet para kumasya lahat ng skeletons natin sa loob. But with a person beside you, you have somebody that will pick you up. You will have somebody that will encourage you. And you will have somebody to offer his shoulder for you to cry on. That's what discipleship is all about. Some of us here says, discipleship, I'd rather go home and watch crash landing on you. The last episode is today. Correct? For those that are snickering and smiling, now I know what you're doing when you get home because my wife does the same thing. So, guys, pursue wisdom. Look for it like buried treasure. Understand it. Store it in your heart. Apply it. And to make things grow faster and make it more effective and in some ways fun, grab somebody to walk alongside you. And every time that you have a pothole, a lubak, or a stone, think opportunity to grow. Don't think of it as, ayan na naman eh, ang dami ko nang problema, ito pa isa. Step over it. Step over it. And glorify God while doing it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. Thank you so much to, uh, for all the things that you've done for us. 
Lord, change our hearts. Change the way we think, change the way we behave, change the way we act through the wisdom that you've given us in the Bible. And Lord, please bring somebody alongside us to walk together with us. We need to walk in glory to your name. No matter what we're going through, we should understand that you are in control of everything and we should just trust in you, find peace in you, and then hope for, that we will glorify your name through the life that you have given us here on earth. We pray this in the mighty name of Christ. Amen and amen. Thank you, guys. God bless you.